So I was getting a lot of calls and making a lot of calls to clients during the last two weeks since things have really started to go haywire there. And um, naturally for the church as well. Lots of prayer requests, lots of people that need prayer and need help, and that's what we're here for. That's what we do. And you have to be like David was. It says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. You may remember this when uh, he went out with his army. The enemy came and ransacked the city of Ziklag and took all his possessions and their wives and children. And when he came back, his men wanted to stone them. Stone him, sorry, as the leader. And uh, it says so strongly, it's such an important encouragement for us that David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what we have to do right now. That's the kind of battlefield mentality that we're in right now. No matter what's going on around us, we take our strength from the true north. The compass of God is pointed to the true north. And Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we know that you hold our future. And we're not going to allow our faith to fail here. It says, Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith in the earth? It says about his hometown, he could do no miracles there because of their unbelief. That's a stronghold. That's, that's a, a stronghold against our ability to walk in faith. You have to make some tough decisions. You're not going to make good decisions if you're hijacked by fear. You have to be at peace. We had a friend, John Paul Jackson. I'm sure a lot of you know who he was. He passed away. But when he was here speaking with us, he said, peace is the potting soil of revelation." sounds like it's almost a proverb. It's not from the Bible, but it's a brilliant thought that we need revelation now more than ever because we're facing decisions we haven't ha had to face before. So if you're not at peace, you're going to make bad decisions. So probably the main scripture I've quoted in the last couple of weeks since all this has started to be so prevalent on people's minds is this portion of scripture. I started saying it because of the panic that happened in the market so early. And I realized that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, just quickened this portion of Scripture to me because the book of Hebrews has always been very special to me. It's not an easy book to understand, but it's really rich. And in Hebrews chapter 2, I'll, I'll read it from this translation. It says, uh, 2.14, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. All right, I'm just going to stop there for a minute. Go back to the original plan of God back in Genesis. And we know that God put Adam and Eve in the garden that were made in his image. And that he made us man and woman in his image. And we are to reproduce after his kind. That was God's plan, right? He wanted fellowship with us. The unlimited power of God was now put into a body of limitation to express himself that way. When they sinned, actually what the devil said to Adam and Eve was, you won't die. If you eat from this tree, you will not die. And they didn't die as soon as they ate it, but they brought death into the kingdom. Okay, so that's the big failure in the garden that allowed sin to come into the world. And we know from the New Testament that it says the wages of sin is death. So they didn't die when they ate the fruit, but they brought death into the kingdom. And from that point on, a war was established between God and the sin of humanity. And the only way around that sin of humanity is through Christ. It's through the sacrifice that we just celebrated when we took communion. No other thing can redeem us but the blood of Jesus, that substitutionary death that he took for us. We deserve the punishment. He took it. Now you have to voluntarily come in under his lordship and say, I receive that forgiveness that you offer me. I will live the rest of my life loving you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Doesn't mean you're perfect as a Christian, but if you're loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you are a man and woman after God's own heart. That's what he asked us to be. That's what he admired about David. That's what God said about David. A man after my own heart. Perfect? No. Flaws. Plenty of flaws. We all have them. But after God's heart, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So how does that apply to Hebrews chapter 2? He starts by warning us 
that because children, we're God's children, and we're in this sinful state of the flesh and blood that we inherited from Adam and Eve, and there's no recompense for that. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away that sin. And it's voluntary. You, you don't just get it automatically. You have to submit your surrendering your will to the Lord voluntarily and saying, yes, I recognize that in my state, I cannot save myself. You can save me. So the comparison in Hebrews 2.14 says, because we are made of flesh and blood, the son also had to become flesh and blood. So the first Adam, we know sinned in the garden. Jesus is referred in the New Testament as the second Adam. So the second Adam came in our form. Now I'm just going to take you back to the garden again for a minute. And a lot of you probably have heard me talk about this. We were at a friend's house and we saw a sculpture and it was a little hard to understand what it was for at first. And, and then I realized it was a picture of Adam being formed out of the dust, which is what it says in Genesis about how God formed Adam, that we are dust and God breathed life into Adam, right? So in the garden, there was a perfect man who had never sinned. Once they sinned, there were no people after Adam that had never sinned before. When he was first created, he was a sinless being, dust, flesh and blood with no sin. All through humanity, nobody else met that standard until Jesus came. And that he comes and he's born of flesh and blood. And we know that he doesn't sin. Amazingly, even though he's tempted in every way just like we are, he never sins. So that when he's taken to the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it says... He says, it is finished. He gave up the ghost, right, in the old language. He surrendered his spirit to the Father. That was the first time in history a human being lived from birth to death as an adult without sinning. The very plan that God had all along is that we would not have any sin. So by him living that full life and him saying it is finished, He's saying the cycle of death has now been broken because somebody did what God intended all along. They were born, they lived, they died, no sin. That's why he became the perfect sacrifice to us. And that's why there was this ripping open of heaven. It was a violent act when Jesus gave up his spirit the, the, the rocks cracked open, the graves popped open, people came out of the graves because it was like whoosh similar to the sound that would happen on the day of Acts, uh, uh, day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, when it says a sound like a mighty rushing wind came. There was a release from heaven when Jesus finished that cycle and said, it is finished, boom. That was a historic day. No one had ever lived a full life with no sin. We know 50 days later after Passover, that was the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit was given. We might be a little surprised when Jesus said to the disciples, it's actually good that I go, because if I go, the comforter will come. That's Holy Spirit. Can you just lift your hand and thank God that you have Holy Spirit living in you right now? Where would we be without that? If all we had was the law, it says that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But the Spirit alone won't work without the law. So we have to know the Word and be energized by the Spirit. So again, I'm still trying to keep you in Hebrews here. There was one way things went. Adam and Eve sinned. Humanity inherited that sin. Now Jesus comes and breaks the grip of death. Because by dying without sin, he defeated the power of death. He rose again. Coming out of that grave meant that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now alive in you if you're a Christian. Because you can't say, Jesus is my Lord without Holy Spirit energizing that inside of you. A lot of teaching there, but I'll just keep going in Hebrews 2.14. It says, for only as a human being could he die, and not only, I'm sorry, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Okay? Only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And this is really what I want you to focus on. Verse 15. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. In another translation, it says, all 
who her, their whole lives have been tormented by the fear of dying. That is what we're witnessing in the world right now. The panic and the torment of the fear of dying. And I'm not saying that Christians don't have some sense of that fear. We're, we're not people that have a death wish on us, okay? But what we do have is an eternal perspective of knowing that death has been defeated. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul could say, oh, death, where is your sting, right? Because he understands. And, and you could go back even into church history and find out when the Christians were being brought into the Roman Colosseum to be eaten by lions. They were singing worship songs on the way in because they were so convinced that the resurrection was real that they knew whatever happens to me in this life is just part of the story because there's another life coming when this life is over. And just like Jesus rose from the dead and had a new body, we are going to get a new body. We're not going to be playing harps on clouds, okay? The Bible says in Revelation that the new Jerusalem comes back to the earth and that the saints, we are the saints, are going to rule and reign with him forever. That's what an eternal perspective does. That's what allows you not to be hijacked by fear right now because no matter what happens in this life, we still win in the end, but we're going to keep fighting while we're here. We're not going to allow ourselves to be hijacked by this war that's going on. We are going to stand in the midst of the pain of the world and stand in that gap and let people know they don't have to live in this fear of torment of dying. We're the ones with the good news. It's not good advice. It's good news. And they don't know it. <laughs> only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. 